Hi everybody, my name is Max Feinstein and I'm an anesthesiology resident at the Mount Sinai Hospital in New York City. You're watching Careers in Medicine, a series that I've created to interview physicians to learn about specialties and subspecialties in medicine. On today's special episode, we're talking with Dr. Mark Sherwin, an attending anesthesiologist at Mount Sinai Hospital, about his experience being an anesthesiologist during the COVID-19 pandemic. I should mention that the views and opinions expressed in this video do not represent those of Mount Sinai Hospital. Let's get started. Uh, so I'm Mark Sherwin. I'm an attending anesthesiologist at the Mount Sinai Hospital. So we're now about two days away from May. Uh, at our hospital at Mount Sinai, we've been you know, dealing with the COVID-19 pandemic for a little over a month and a half now. I'd say just around middle of March is when our lives really just got completely changed around and what was the new normal. Um, what, you know, what used to be my schedule of the cases I would do Monday through Friday became a very different system. You know, the way that we at Mount Sinai dealt with it, um, at, at least in the anesthesia department, was kind of div div dividing us up into teams and kind of trying to keep all the teams separate to keep us all contained and not intermingling too much. Um, but what's unique about anesthesiology is that we kind of have the perfect skill set for dealing with this disease process, right? We are the experts in pulmonary physiology, and we're experts in critical care, um, in dealing with intubations and sick patients and crashing patients. And so all these things are very easy for us, really. I mean, this is what we get trained in. So, you know, it was also very natural for us to go into settings like the ICU and help with, um, you know, dealing with ventilated patients um, or crashing patients and dealing with rapid response team uh, management. So eventually after things kind of ramped up and it became a huge surge at this hospital and all around New York City, we got divided up into even more teams. So initially for me, I was actually put in the middle of March, I was put onto the OB team. So I spent a little bit of time as the labor floor team where we were only gonna be doing just the labor floor uh, all the time. Eventually, you know, they needed more people in areas that were more critical care oriented. So I was then put into a medical ICU, a non-COVID ICU. Um, however, the amount of patients really surged very quickly. And so what was planned for on a Monday from Thursday became the next day on Friday I was there to what would be a change by the following week would became an, all of a sudden by the next day I was in the next unit which was the COVID ICU so we converted actually a non-ICU floor into a COVID ICU and so me and several other anesthesiologists were then the COVID team and we did that for a few weeks um, and then eventually the numbers started to level out um, and lessen a little bit and so after that decline uh, they were able to bring a few of us back to the operating room so now I'm back in the operating room and things aren't totally normal you know we're six weeks into like the pandemic at this point in new york city and i would say you know we're still doing about a tenth of the amount of surgeries that we were doing before so and we're really only prioritizing emergent really urgent surgeries so before when maybe i'd spend a day doing you know gallbladders and hernias you know, we're not doing those surgeries right now. So most of my cases that we're doing are really surgeries that are more emergent. As an anesthesiologist in the ICU, you know, there is a level of familiarity, um, but as well, it's not my specialty. So going into critical care is a fellowship you can do for a one-year fellowship after residency. Um, me and the majority of my colleagues don't do that. We're still running an ICU. And so um, it was, it was difficult. I'd say the most difficult thing was the levels of care that we're not used to. So worrying about nutrition, uh, worrying about all the prophylactic measures that we don't do on a day-to-day -day basis. When it came to managing patients on the ventilator and managing different acid-based disturbances and different levels of hemodynamics that we had to worry about, you know, patients we're getting cardiomyopathies and developing malignant arrhythmias and hypotension, dealing with pressors. We're experts in these. This was very, that was very natural for us to kind of be the experts of dealing with those patients. But on the day to day, just rounding in the ICU and worrying about um, things that don't like usually cross our paths, like nutrition orders, uh, was something that you know we had to get kind of attuned to. 
Um, but otherwise, you know, it's it's similar in the way. You know, we we have at least four to six months of experience in residency doing critical care. So luckily, only being two years out, I kind of can remember some of those things from not too long ago. Uh, I'd say the hardest part about doing the COVID ICU was being away from the operating room. Actually, it just it was, you know, you you kind of fall in love with your career and what you do every day. And I love what I do every day. And so it was sad not getting to come into work and do that. I really missed it. So that was probably one of the hardest parts. It was nice because I'm still around all my colleagues. We were running the ICU together. But the other hard part about being in the COVID ICU, which is like being in any ICU, is that I didn't get to do that same level of um, immediate result care where I need to go get this medication and instead I'm ordering it or you know, going to say, okay, let's, let's do plasma light. We have to wait for it to get here from the pharmacy versus, versus everything's right there in front of you where I can give it myself in the operating room. So pre-COVID PPE um, in the operating room, you know, we're obviously trying to protect the sterility of the operating room and make sure the patients still get infections. So our main things are wearing surgical masks, hats to protect from you know, hair falling out or having anything from our breath go into the patient. Um, but now our biggest concern is really the opposite of what the patients are giving to us. And that's always been a concern for us. Um, but you know, we're really concerned about now who is, you know, who is infected with coronavirus and could spread it to us. And then we now are potentially spreading it to everyone else. So pre-COVID PPE, um, we wear surgical masks, hats, you know, we'd always wear gloves and typically we double glove. And so this way when we intubate, which is again, the biggest risk of infection, because we still have to worry about that, whether there was COVID or not, worrying about infection when we put our hands into the mouth um, and then touch other things around us. So typically double glove and take off those gloves after we intubate, um, you know, always cleaning our ports before we give any medication, keeping things capped. We always did those things, but now we really are more concerned about when we are intubating someone and are potentially aerosolizing the virus, can we get it? So now when we intubate someone, uh, we are wearing an N95, just with a mask to cover that, and then some sort of protective face shield. You know, if you have a patient with known COVID, we, you know, we're wearing protective, um, we're like protective gowns to make sure that we're not getting anything else on us. We can take those off after we intubate. Uh, we have some designs that we've used, whether it's um, the intubation boxes that you may have seen where there are basically clear boxes that we use to kind of protect from that aerosolization going everywhere. Other things, we are pretty much intubating everyone now in a video laryngoscope and rapid sequence fashion. It's not exactly, you know, we don't have to actually do a full rapid sequence where we're doing cricoid. Um, but really the goal is not to ventilate. Our main thing is we don't want to try to aerosolize and spread around this virus. So, you know, we're giving really, I'd say almost any patient now, a rapid sequence intubation by not ventilating them and trying to do a video laryngoscope so we really reduce the amount of time that we may take to actually put the endotracheal tube in. Um, another thing that, you know, just the other day, I remember I was intubating a patient for a procedure that on a normal day, I would do something called an LTA, like, um, where I basically use atomized lidocaine in the trachea. And um, the idea with using atomized lidocaine in the trachea is that you can basically help reduce some of that stimulation of the endotracheal tube itself. And I'm not gonna do that anymore because we don't want to, again, basically make everything aerosolized. So it's just small little things that are kind of changing our practice. Um, other things we're doing in this COVID era, uh, you know, we are requiring a a COVID uh, test preoperatively, usually about 24 to 48 hours before. So, you know, want to make sure that if a patient is coming in with known COVID, we bring them to a certain operating room that may have more negative pressure abilities um, or we're cleaning it in a different fashion, not keeping all the same amount of instruments and equipment in those rooms. So, you know, there are differences on the day-to-day -day life that we all are experiencing. You know, everyone's wearing masks around the hospital, um, really just trying to protect ourselves and all our patients. I think at the moment, now that we are about six weeks in, about to be in May, and we're seeing somewhat of a decline, I think there is a sense of more hope and optimism and normalcy in the day-to-day. -day. You know, we're definitely not normal at the moment. We're doing one-tenth the amount of cases that we were doing before, and the sense of kind of 
we need to go, we need to go, come on, you know, we have 10 cases to do today, we need to get this done, that's not there anymore. Whether it's because there's just less cases to do or because we're really just being cognizant of the fact that this is an emergency, we need to get those results back, we need to make sure that we're doing all the right stuff. I think everyone's a little bit more relaxed in terms of time to try to make sure we do everything correctly. So there's that difference, but also I think we're slowly getting back to that normal where we're doing the things that we always enjoy doing, working as a team, doing surgery, and taking care of patients, which is nice to kind of get back to that versus you know, not being in an area that you're used to. So being back in the normal operating room has made things a lot better. Well, that wraps up this interview with Dr. Sherwin. I'm very appreciative that he took the time to come in on a day off to share his insights and experiences with us. If you have any feedback, go ahead and leave it in the comments below. And if you'd like to be notified when I post new videos, go ahead and subscribe. Thanks very much and stay safe.